Yeah, so I just want to talk really about the completion of Austin MSA and some of the info surveys that we've been doing. We had a fantastic day yesterday, um, this is a national MT workshop. Well, we celebrated the um, completion of OSLAMP and we are releasing a lot of data which is available on CEREC now. So it just gives you a bit of an overview there on the map on the left. Uh, we're pretty much releasing all the OSLAMP MT sites. Also the long overview, Eucla, Gola, MT broadband profile from the central Gola crater and further to the west. And also a very preliminary data set of the Olympic domain info survey that we've been doing this year. Um, I should say that is preliminary, we haven't quite finished QAQC, but we wanted to put the data forward just because it has um, generated a lot of interest. Um, starting out on the big picture um, with OSLAM, which is, it's actually got a lot of international recognition um, for the way Australia is using, you know, fundamental big scale, continental scale data set for mineral exploration. And just the kind of ideas that we generate in the Australian community. Uh, this just gives you an overview of where we're at. The red points are uh, what we've acquired so far. Green is currently planned and uh, budgeted for, and all the rest of the stations uh, still need to be acquired. There's a will to do this. Um, money has to be found, but it's relatively cheap if you compare to gravity or magnetics and the way that has been rolled out across the continent, and the results are really remarkable and very different to the previous techniques that we have. Um, so if you just look at the data, for example, this is not even the model. I'm, I'm, quite as, I'm personally quite astonished by these images. This is the data we acquired across South Australia and also the data that's been released by Geoscience Australia across Victoria. On the left, you see the induction arrows are pointing towards conductors. Uh, you know, in a half space around about tens to a few hundred kilometers away around each station. On the right, you see phase sensors, kind of more the orientation of the long axis tells you where the currents are flowing. Just looking at the uh, orientation of these um, uh, representations of the data tells you a lot about just the connectivity structure and actually also of the underlying geology. You know, these are really far looking uh, data sets and just kind of pointing out where you have features such as, you know, around the Gola Crater and the Musgrave province. All these things come out by just looking at the data. It's really remarkable by just plotting it all on that sort of scale. Um, Oslim was designed to be a deep probing data set, um, but to our surprise, if you run the 3D inversion models of the data that we run on the NCI and the supercomputer, and you just plot the first kilometer, you're still seeing that you're actually still sensitive to the sediments on top. And in the first order, get a very good representation of you know, the sediment thickness from a, a data set where the stations are spaced every 50 kilometers. So the, you know, we have underlain here the geological provinces uh, in black outlines and the correlation is really quite remarkable. It's not designed to do that. Uh, what's been designed is to replace some of the older um, nationwide models that we have in terms of the connectivity structure. This is a data set that's derived just from induction error data. So the previous plot had the induction errors on the left. It's just derived from that and actually only from stations that are collected roughly every 500 kilometers and not plotted here on top of here, plotted just the Austin stations. But with that sort of resolution, this is what you get. Um, this is sort of the scale of the connectivity corridors, you know, that are roughly, you can kind of make out where some of the main uh, cratons are, but that's about it. If you overlay what we've got now across the um, South Australia from the Austin project, this is what you get. That's the sort of scale of the additional res resolution, I should say, this is in the lower crust here, 30 kilometers. It just shows you the, the level up in granularity that you get from these data sets. Um, it's really remarkable. So we also have then models now that our colleagues from Geoscience Australia are working on uh, that is covering uh, Victoria and New South Wales and also in the Exploring for the Future program up here. So we're starting to fill the gaps and it's really exciting just to see the, the level of granularity coming out of that. So what did we learn from Oslo per se? Um, there are many things. I just want to highlight perhaps three things that we did not know before Oslo in that sort of sense. It's really the, the, the fundamental um, correlation of a lot of the copper gold mineralization that we have in South Australia and how they are correlating, and I'll show that in the next two slides and there's a video as well, uh, how they're correlating with some of these cross to conductors. So these are seemingly deep 30 kilometers here but still a first order correlation between us, really remarkable. We learned a lot about photonic margins of how they control a lot of the deformation that leads to the lower resistivity. The second one is that, and that follows really on from what uh, um, Claire's been just talking about, 
is the connection of this mineral system concept. So the mineral system of from the ore deposit that surface into a metasomatized mantle signature and the gold craton. So the gold craton has a mantle signature that is distinctly different to a lot of the Archean cratons around the world. And I think that's also one of the primary ingredients of why we have that mineralization that we have here in our ICG deposits. What we also learned, which is quite interesting in this long kind of debate about the relationship between the corner mono province and the Gola Craton, we see in our models now there's a very clear from the mantle up into the crust uh, lower uh, resistivity connection between them, which seems to support some of the ideas that you know they were joined together at some stage and rifted apart. You can still see that now, just in these images where you have these conductors here, they're more or less linear in the north northeast direction, which is cut, could just represent the failed rift. Um, you know, extending between those, those two domains. This is just an image now. The points on top here in yellow are the gold deposits, brown are copper, and the green are the diamond deposits. This is an isosurface at 100 ohmmeters, is somewhat an arbitrary value. Everything inside the isosurface is quite conductive. Um, where there's a void, it's usually a fairly resistive lithosphere that usually means dry and depleted. The model here goes down to 300 kilometers depth. I will point out, um, really interestingly, is that feature down there, which is this gold mantle uh, conductor that we have, and that sort of feeds up into this arcuate shape uh, conductors near the surface here that are in the crust. What I've also added is more structure in the Musgraves in the northeast of the state. And really the northeast is something Kate Robertson from, from uh, our team worked on. It's a very unexplored area. You don't really know anything about the crust and mantle underneath, and Austin gives us the first images. I don't have time to really talk about it, but there's already existing talks uh, on the web that you can download. Um, really interesting to see some of the features, the Musgrave problems as well. Very interesting elongated connectivity structures go right through it, connects the naval Babel to what we have in the South Australian side. Um, at least from a primary architecture, it's definitely worth exploring that more. I already mentioned the correlation. Um, I think it's worth putting another image up just for that. This is the correlation here of the copper deposits. Um, the ones in green are the actual contained resources and how that lines up with some of the lower crust of connectivity structures. The copper deposits are varying in type. You have the ICG deposits, but also a lot of uh, the sediment hosted uh, copper deposits. You, know, you wonder why the sediments uh, hosted you know, correlate with the connectivity structure. But what we learned yesterday from the National MT workshop is just looking at other parts of Australia, that seems to be the case as well. You can even trace changes in the thickness of the lithosphere and how that correlates with some of the sedimentary hosted depo uh, deposits. Really interesting work that comes out of Geoscience Australia there. And we see a similar story here where uh, a lot of the disruptions in the crust where mental and fluid flux in the past have come through seems to primarily control where the, some of these deposits are. So it's really interesting. So you might wonder, okay, that's the first step. Um, it's obviously a, um, as someone said yesterday, it's a Mickey Mouse view of the world in the sense that, you know, these conductors are very broad um, and then you can't really use them for direct targeting. So the way forward is scale reduction. So this is a chief info, uh, info service which we've embarked on now. At the last year's discovery day, Kate Robertson from our team said, MT found Olympic Dam. Um, that was meant to be a joke, which is obviously not true, but I think what she meant to say is that Olympic Dam found MT. In a sense, for our community, it has been really pivotal. Uh, it's the example of running just an M2 DMT profile across it and getting these signatures that have now been uh, published this year. Again, uh, an updated view of, of the uh, Olympic Dam. And just kind of seeing these conductive pathways coming up to a lot of the prospects. So it's really been pushing the community along and on the on the base of that, uh, we are now embarking on a lot of the info surveys. I want to talk about, we've done actually three this year or uh, end of last year, but I really want to talk about the number one and number two. So just to you know, show you one, what you can achieve by doing an info across the corner Mono province, which we talked about last year. And then I want to also show some slides on the recent info survey across the Olympic domain, which is just south of Olympic Dam, but includes a lot of the prospects that we have across there. Um, so. This is a really nice slide because it does illustrate you again the scale reduction and the increase in resolution. I showed you before the national image from what we had from induction hours down to info of Ostland. This is now going from Ostland data, which is collected every 50 kilometers on the left. And we've taken here a cross section down to a 60 kilometers. And we compare that to an info survey collected along a profile with stations every two kilometers. 
And you just see the increase in resolution here. So the image on the right has now the depth down to 25 kilometers, so it's just in the top half of the one of the image on the left. But you just kind of see, you know, two or three main blobs in the left image, but the refinement that you get from it just on the right shows you what you can achieve with the kind of info service that we are embarking on. So this then brings me to the um, really a lot of the work that we've been doing this year. I uh, contracted this out to do data collection uh, by Zong across the Olympic domain. We collected 323 MT sites, BOP and, and AMT, very high frequency, station spacing on the order between one and a half and three kilometers. It's a trade-off between the area you want to cover and uh, really how much money you have. Uh, we've also flown Airborne EM, which is also released, and in the future we are thinking of combining that uh, with some collaborators. Um, and in green there down the bottom, there's also six edit station, which has also been released as a data package by Investigator Resources, um, just to give it a slightly better uh, coverage around um, one of their targets. So all this data, um, is really what I should say is in both of these images, the underlying color is a depth slice of OSLAMP at 20 kilometers gives you some of the reasoning here of why you want to do it in that area. We obviously know its perspective, but also fundamentally what we see further down below is that the Ostland data shows us it's conductive and again it's again this proof of concept that these conductors seem to be coming up from below and then sort of uh, narrow down into some of the areas where the prospects are. That's potentially, that's the model, but we need more examples to, to show that. The data is somewhat variable, um, but you know I'm just showing some examples here. I just want to highlight really the, the bandwidth of the data so we can really resolve features from just a few meters under every station down to the uh, bottom of the crust. And then if you want to look further down, you basically use OSLAM. So we have one continuous EM data set from OSLAM to this and to the AEM. So we can really define from an you know, EM signal all the way up to the surface down to the scale of meters. It's a really remarkable test area uh, to bring all these data sets together. Um, if you look at the data, this is looking again at a representation of the data that gives you an indication of where currents preferentially flow. This is plotted for three different periods, whereas the one on the image on the left tells you more at the behavior of what happens at the sediment to basement interface. And the coloring really just tells you that some of the sediments probably in this part are deeper than they are here. Um, the middle image at 10 seconds speaks to around about the upper to middle crust. Um, we have a very nice alignment in the northwest direction, which is the direction of the Gerdner Dyke Swarm, so it seems to be that the magmatic events to have some effect. On the right-hand side, a thousand seconds, we're now looking well into the lower crust. Uh, there seems to be alignment in the north, roughly north-south direction. And again, that's what we're seeing from MT. You know, it's just basically telling you the conductive margin where a lot of the magma, uh, magma sort of used to come through. Um, you know, generally aligned in the north-south direction in that area. Um, I'm just going to show a 3D inversion model slices here. This is extremely preliminary. These models are still running. I just pulled them out from while well, they were still running on the NCI on the supercomputer. And we still have to finish the QA to see. So these things will change for sure. Um, but in the first order, it's very interesting. Three different depth slices here. The first one um, tells you uh, really a representation again of the sediments uh, at 650 meters depth. I should point out, it's a little bit hard to see, but the red triangles there are some of the ISG prospects that we have. And just the recent release of Oak Dam, for example, up here, 600 uh, kind of, you know, intercepted basement at around 800, 900 meters. So it's still quite red in this color, which means we're still in the sediment. So it's nice to see that EMT data uh, reproduces the sediment thickness that we know in the area. Um, the next two depth slices are now in a sort of more upper crust. And what we interestingly see here is that in general, there's this north-south orientation of a uh, resistor, and a lot of the, it seems at least in the first part, a lot of the prospects here are sitting roughly where the gradients are. So this is curve patina here, Masson's down there, uh, Oak Dam again up here. So in the first order, it seems to be somewhat a correlation, but I should stress we, we still need to do a lot of work to really pin down some of the geometry that we're seeing in the data. But it's exciting. Moving on to the future. We will continue the info surveys um, in areas that are looking interesting to us and you know that really where we want to change the competitive space. Um, in other new ideas, we're also thinking, you know, why do you just want to stop Oslo and one just on land? Um, you know, you can always go offshore. Um, the continental shelf is quite large across South Australia. 
it's interesting in an energy kind of space. And we actually want to venture now in collaboration with uh, Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, who are the uh, world's leaders in marine MT. Uh, University of Adelaide and also Geoscience Australia, what we're planning to do is just a pilot study of marine MT um, across the Spencer Gulf. There are several reasons here. One of them is there's a major boundary, uh, lithospheric boundary in the Gola Craton. You know, Stacey Curtis published a really nice paper of an uh, MT and an isotope study in the north uh, of Air Peninsula, where she showed really nicely, you know, that we're expecting to see boundary questions what happens further south, just given also the variability in the gravity and magnetics we see across the Spencer Gulf. It does value add to a data set we've just collected across the Tumpy Bay area down here as well. And um, so this is just gives a really great opportunity. The price of this is very comparable to Ausland. It's actually not more expensive and it's really exciting. And I just want to then finish up with another idea and really a fundamental data set that we're interesting. MT is not, it's like I would like to believe, it's not the, the only solution to the problem. Seismic tomography has a lot of history in Australia, uh, especially in the southeastern part, but we're lacking the coverage in South Australia. It's a fundamental data set, as you will also find out from Klaus Regenauer's sleep talk, which is coming up next, where we're actually trying to combine all these data sets together with the composition of the mantle, but we need these fundamental data sets for that to be successful. So what we would like to do is actually roll out, uh, slowly roll out seismic tomography across the continent and piggyback on previous uh, deployments and locations that we have access to from Oslo. Awesome.